All right. Um, ionic bonds, though, are typically a little stronger. And not even all covalent bonds are the same energy. An oxygen-oxygen single bond, single covalent bond, is not as strong as a carbon-carbon single bond. And so there's a lot more that goes into it rather than just say it's covalent. We can make broad classifications like ionic bonds tend to be stronger than covalent bonds. Covalent bonds tend to be stronger than intermolecular forces, which is when you've got um, charges that are somewhat attracted to each other, but aren't really as attracted as a full ionic bond. We're going to keep fleshing that out. Um, but the idea is it's, it's really more of a continuum. There actually isn't like a hard dividing line between ionic bonds and covalent bonds. Turns out there's a lot of other factors that go into it. And there really is sort of a, a sliding scale. Things, covalent bonds can be perfectly covalent or they can be partially covalent. We call it a polar covalent bond. And then the most polar covalent bonds are approaching an ionic bond. But there's not really like one definitive line where we can say this is covalent, that's ionic. Yeah, polar covalent bonds So when we get into dissolving things, so it depends on the ionic bond is the, is the broad question. And so we have to kind of define our intermolecular forces and look at how we could sum them up. But in general, covalent bonds don't break when you dissolve a covalent molecule into water. They stay all as one molecule. That's one of the first things that they use to classify covalent versus ionic. Ionic compounds, when they dissolved in water, split up into their ions into their individual ions that were all surrounded by water molecules and covalent compounds didn't. Covalent compounds, when they dissolve in general, stay together as one molecule. Um, and explaining why that is has to do with the fact that you've got more non-metals around in a covalent bond. And so splitting up isn't going to actually leave you with a more stable system. If you have a positive charge and a negative charge, like an ionic bond, splitting them up in water actually can can make the whole system more stable because the water molecules can surround each of those charges individually and make the whole system more stable um and if you didn't follow any of that just wait till we get to talking about intermolecular forces and solubility and that'll make a little bit more sense um can how can both diamonds and graphite be made of just carbon but be so different because they're different types of covalent bonds. Graphite is like we just talked about with pencil lead. Graphite is pure carbon, but it's carbons that are all linked together in these flat sheets that look like hexagons. Or you have these alternating double bonds. And then this, this structure sort of repeats where you have all of these hexagons sort of fitting together like one big lattice. And a lot of times we'll just draw it like this, where we say, okay, well, this structure then repeats in two dimensions kind of infinitely. Diamond, though, every instead of every carbon being attached to three other carbons, in a diamond, every carbon is attached to four other carbons in a structure that looks, we're not going to quite get to this today. This was in the more relevant section because I thought we were going to get to Vesper geometries, um, but we're not quite going to get there today probably but basically what this you can picture every single one of these carbons is in this sort of three-dimensional shape it looks like a three-sided pyramid um so in a diamond all of these carbons every single carbon is is attached in three dimensions to other carbons with graphite they're only attached in two dimensions this is basically one molecule thick or one atom thick that extends like a sheet of paper. So it's a little bit like the difference between papers made out of wood, right? But a stack of papers like this has different properties than a piece of wood that's the same size, right? Same atoms, but these ones, they're not all attached to each other, right? So the fact that they're attached in three dimensions versus in two dimensions changes physical properties. 
We see that a lot with solids. If we change how the physical properties are, or how the, the bonds are set up, we change physical properties that we can actually observe, um, like melting point or like how hard it is or like whether it's clear or, or transparent or not. Um, all of that's related to the molecular structure. And then last but not least, just because I keep getting questions similar to this, um, or maybe it doesn't seem that similar, but things like, are we sure the electrons are the smallest objects in the universe, or what is a quark, or how do quarks are attack, you know, factor into this whole protons and neutrons? Um, basically, this is getting into what's called the standard model um, of physics, which is basically, here are all of our, what we call fundamental particles. And these fundamental particles all have certain properties. And if you combine them in different ways, you get every other type of matter. So basically protons, neutrons, and electrons, but on a bigger scale, smaller scale, but more universal. So protons, neutrons, and electrons combined, we can make every type of, of uh, element on the periodic table and every type of matter. Turns out protons are made up of quarks. And things that are, we call exotic matter are also made up of quarks or made up of neutrinos and things like that. All of that factors into what's called the standard model. And if that's something that's interesting to you, um, then I would encourage you to start by Googling like introduction to the standard model because I'm not a theoretical physicist. I never took a class on any of that stuff. Um, so all I know about is what I picked up over the years answering questions like yours. Um, I can hopefully offer some clarification from time to time, but I'm not by far not the best person to talk to about that. And so there's, you know, look up some, some YouTube videos. Um, just make sure it seems like it's a reputable scientist talking about this stuff and not just some guy who's going to go off on a, down a rabbit hole and talk to you about his conspiracy theories about reptile people. Um, because you will get into that field. If you, start getting into some of these theoretical physics you wind up with people that think they understand theoretical physics and then tie it to things like you know the reptilians control everything or um you know things like that so careful with what videos you watch there's a lot of garbage out there uh, but if it seems like they're a real scientist then there's then um that would be a good place to start learning about this and then followed up by taking more physics classes at, at a college um, when you get into second, third year physics courses, you start getting into the standard model and how things all work together. Nothing against people that like to believe in reptilians and Bigfoot and stuff like that, but it's not exactly what we call science, so to speak. All right. So we ended talking about this the other day, uh, about covalent bonds. And the, the whole idea with covalent bonds is just if we have a bunch of elements that want to try to gain uh, electrons. We don't really have an, enough electrons to go around to just make everything an ion, right? We can't satisfy everything if we have only non-metals around. Which actually does bring up, somebody else asked a question about why are there so many metals and not as many non-metals? Part of that is just happens to be where we are in our solar system and the our solar system and its chemical makeup um, is kind of dictates where that stair step line is. If we had a lot more oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, we already have a lot of oxygen, but if we had a different ratio of elements, then we would have a different number of electrons to go around, right? And if we had a different number of electrons to go around, we would draw that line, that stair step line would be drawn in a slightly different place. Right? So it all comes down to, in general, do, do compounds get more stable when they gain electrons or lose electrons? If you change how many electrons there are total, that changes that system and where we would draw that line. Um, and then there's a whole field of study in, in semiconductor physics. Um, we can design unique systems that have where we change how many electrons are in the system and that changes the property, how it absorbs light, we call that adjusting the Fermi level um, of electrons in a semiconductor. Um, you may have heard of it uh, referred to as uh, doped semiconductors, P-type semiconductors versus N-type semiconductors. All that is is changing how many electrons are in the system, which changes whether things behave like a metal or a non-metal. And right, so 
if but in general we're going to stick to our standard cases if it's a non-metal it's trying to gain electrons if it's a metal it's trying to lose electrons to become more stable so how do how does that factor in well if we only have non-metals we can't have something with a positive charge that's an approximation but it's a good place to start for now and we'll build on that later so if all we have is non-metals and we have a co we have a covalent compound made up of these covalent bonds where electrons have to be shared right so that allows one of the ways we represent this is with these dots it's called a lewis dot structure if we have a fluorine atom that has seven electrons here we have either another fluorine atom or just say it's a hydrogen over here hydrogen needs to gain one electron to be stable right fluorine needs to gain one electron to be stable if they're able to share this pair of electrons if they're able to put those electrons into a physical space where these this pair of electrons is in both valences at the same time then we can make everybody happy understanding it's not these aren't really actually happy, right? These atoms don't have personalities or wants or desires. The universe just moves towards stability, which means the universe moves towards everything has a full valence as often as possible. When I say happy, that's what I mean, more stable. Um, and so in general, we can judge or we can, can guess how many bonds, covalent bonds, the different elements want to make by simply looking at how many electrons do they need to gain to be stable. Since we're always talking about non-metals at this point when it comes to covalent bonds, we just look at how many vacant vacancies they have. So fluorine needs to gain one electron to be stable. So we could say it has one vacancy before it gets to a full energy level. So therefore we can look at that and say, okay, well, fluorine is gonna form one bond. Oxygen has two vacancies, right? Oxygen has six valence electrons and it has two empty spots that I'm representing with the X's there. Two empty spots means it can make two bonds. Again, like everything you're gonna learn in this class, this is an oversimplification. This is a good place to start for learning how things work. We're gonna go in and adjust this later. Um, but effectively, if it's in the second row of the periodic table, it can only get up to eight electrons. And so based all you're trying to do, say, okay, how many electrons does it need to share? How many electrons does it need to gain in order to be stable? So just like we'd say oxygen needs to gain two electrons. So oxide is a minus two. We could also say oxide has two vacancies, so it's going to form two bonds. The same logic applies both the ionic and covalent bonds, right? It's difference is, is it a charge that needs to be balanced out? Or are we just making these shared electrons to balance everything out? All right, so, and just to show you several other ways we can show this, um, these Lewis dot structures, every dot represents one electron. Um, when we start drawing bonds, we represent these bonds as a line. That line has two electrons in it. So a Lewis dot structure is just a way of showing where all the electrons are and where the bonds are, where the covalent bonds are that are attaching. All right, so um, did you do it, work with, with a little bit of Lewis dot structures before probably, right? Okay. So we're gonna get into cases where we can get to more than eight electrons, but for now, we're just gonna say everything is gonna be most stable when it has eight valence electrons. And so we just need the number of electrons around each of these atoms has to add up to eight. And if it's a bond, you get to double count those electrons. They can count for each atom that's part of that bond. So oxygen has two, four, six, eight. Fluorine has two, four, six, eight. 
If it's in the first row of the periodic table, does it want eight electrons? Just two electrons for hydrogen, right? So hydrogen only has one vacancy and can only make one bond. Hydrogen will never have more than one bond. All right, so here's our step for drawing Lewis dot structures. Um, if we have a, I thought I found all these ones. That's supposed to be H2O, but the font change messed with it. Um, <laughs> whatever atom is going to make the most bonds, you put it the middle. Then you surround it with the other atoms. You count your total number of valence electrons, and then you just split them up. The easiest way to do this, to split up the electrons, to say how many electrons, how did I know where to put all the electrons here? Well, if I start by just saying, okay, I'm gonna put oxygen in the middle. I'm gonna put a fluorine on each side because I know the fluorines have to be attached or else it's not part of the same molecule, right? If I count up all my valence electrons, here I have seven electrons from each fluorine, right? And there's two of them, two fluorines. And then I have one oxygen that has six valence electrons. So the total number of electrons I have to work with, when I say total I mean, that I have to work with, I mean, we're ignoring the core electrons. We're ignoring the 1s electrons here because those ones are already stable, aren't gonna do anything. We're only looking at the valence electrons. So that's 14 plus six is total of 24 electrons, right? No, that's not right. 14 plus six is 22 electrons. Well, if I have 22 valence electrons to work with, I know that four of them are gonna be tied up in bonds. At least. So that's out of my 22, I just used four of them. So how many do I have left? 18 electrons left. Basically, we're just gonna use this number of electrons to do a running total. Every time we add new electrons to our Lewis dot structure, we subtract them over here until everything has a full valence or I run out of electrons, whatever comes first. So if I have 18 electrons left, step five just says, add the remaining electrons to fill everything's valence. That's kind of vague, right? There are a lot of ways you can do this. Typically, I start at the outside and work, work my way in. Usually makes the most sense. Um, so for instance, in this case, each fluorine has how many electrons around it right now? Two, so each fluorine needs how many more? Six X, six electrons more than the way it's drawn. So I'm just gonna draw those electrons in. And partly just, this is just so you can see it better, but it's partly to make sure you don't forget them. Those, when you're using dots for the electrons, it's really easy on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard, especially a recording, to miss those electrons. And so I typically, if there's a pair of electrons that aren't part of a bond, I draw this little loop shape. Um, that little loop shape is representing, is you know part of this whole thing saying that's a pair of electrons that are not part of the bond. Just because those of you in the back can, can testify, that that's kind of hard to see how many dots I've drawn, especially if I'm going fast. Doing it like this way makes it really easy to count by twos, two, four, six. Um, you don't have to draw those. It's not a bad habit to be in for these lone pairs. They call these, these electrons that are not part of a bond, we'll frequently call them lone pairs. Lone pair just means it's not part of a bond. It's a part of the valence, but not part of the bond. So I added six electrons to each fluorine. How many electrons do I have left now? Did I count wrong in the beginning? I did count wrong in the beginning. It's 20, huh? 
And simple, simple arithmetic is really giving me trouble today. So that was 16 electrons left after my first set of bonds. And then I added another 12. Uh, so that gets me down to four electrons left. Apologies. Not trying to gaslight anybody. I'm, I just can't do simple math right now. So are the fluorines satisfied? Yeah, so we're not gonna touch them anymore at this point. We have four electrons left. How many electrons does the oxygen need? It needs to get to eight. It currently has how many? So it needs another four, right? How convenient, we have four electrons left. So drawing a Lewis dot structure is just all about arranging the atoms and the electrons in a way that, that satisfies a set of criteria. All right, and the, the criteria is always going to come back to, you have to use the right number of electrons. If, we, if it had looked like we already filled up all the valences and we had extra electrons left over, this wouldn't be the right Lewis dot structure. Something else must be going on in that case. We can't make matter out of nothing. So you have to use the exact right number of electrons that you get from your formula. The formula in this case would be OF2. We count up all of our electrons based on what the elements are in the formula. And those are the electrons we have to use in the Lewis dot structure. Second criteria, fill all valences. And these are in order of importance. You have to use the right number of electrons. And if you run out of electrons, you can't, before you fill all the valences, you can't just add extra electrons, right? This is the most crucial. The second most important thing is fill all the valences if possible. And I'm not gonna write the third criteria up there yet because we're gonna start with it with just these two criteria. These are the most important ones and we'll get to the third criteria that determines sometimes we'll have more than one possible Lewis dot structure that both satisfy these first two criteria equally well. How do we decide which is the better one? We'll add that, it's called formal charge. We'll get to that once we've done some practice with simple cases. All right, so here's an example of drawing Lewis dot structure for hydrogen or for water just with the bonds drawn as a pair of electrons. So if I was drawing this structure like that, I'd be showing those the bonds like this, or sometimes you even see them drawn horizontally so that they look like you're connecting a line between those two. Um, I'm not particularly fond of either of these representations. And the more the most common way to draw these just as a bond, as a single line. The trick is just remembering that one line is two electrons when it comes to counting them out, all right? So let's do another one. Let's look at, um, well, we'll do CO2. That's the one that's on the next page. How many valence electrons do we have to work with with, our, with uh, CO2 here? How many valence electrons does the carbon have? Four, and there's one carbon. So we have four electrons to work with from the carbon. Two oxygens, each oxygen is how many? Eight total, but we're gonna ignore the at one S2. So six valence electrons. That's gonna give us a total of 
16 electrons, valence electrons to work with, right? I went from memory on that one so that I didn't have to do the simple arithmetic in front of you today. I know the answer is 16 for this one. So next thing, how do we figure out what goes in the middle? The one that needs the most. Again, there are some qualifications to that and some ways we can, we can make that rule more concrete, but for now, Carbon has the most vacancies, so it goes in the middle. We put an oxygen on either side. Carbon has four vacancies, oxygen has two vacancies. Therefore, carbon's gonna go in the middle. What do we do next? We know that the oxygens have to be attached, right? The oxygens have to be attached to carbon or it's not a molecule. So we just used four of our 16. So we have 12 electrons left. How many does each oxygen need the way it's drawn? It needs to get to eight. How many extra compared to how it's drawn right now? Six each, right? And there's two oxygens. So that's a total of how many? Look at that, we have 12 electrons left. So that's gonna, if we just fill each oxygen's valence, that takes up all of our remaining electrons. Are we done? Well, we're done adding electrons, but this can't be right because this doesn't have all of the valences filled, does it? Oxygens are satisfied, carbon's not. So what do we do? We need to do extra sharing, right? We've used all the electrons we have available. So if we've used all the electrons we have available and we still don't have all the full, all of the valences filled, we basically have to rearrange what we already have and make it so that another pair of electrons can count for both atoms. This oxygen still has eight valence electrons now, right? And this carbon went from four valence electrons to six valence electrons. Are we done? Carbon's still not satisfied yet, right? Needs another pair. So what should we do? Do the same thing to which side? And why does everybody say the right side? It's you're right. This makes more sense. Everything's got a full valence now, right? We use, and as long as we make sure we erase our lone pair when we turn it into an, a double bond, we still have 16 total valence electrons, right? But What if we did this instead? That also satisfies our criteria, doesn't it? Everything has a full valence and we use 16 total electrons. How come nobody said to do it this way? Everybody said to do it the other way. It's not, humans like symmetry in general. And partly because the natural world favors making things symmetrical whenever possible. That's kind of a normal thing that happens in the, in the natural world. This is a better option. Let's talk about how we can show that. I'm gonna drop both possibilities here. The way we can show which of these is better is that term formal charge. I'm going a little bit of order, out of order with the slides. I've moved formal charge to later in the, but it kind of makes sense the way we're covering things today. The way we know 
whether which of these is the better option. They have both, everything has a full valence. I'm going to go back to writing this, our criteria up here. Right number of electrons, check. Full valences. Check. The last criteria is formal charge as close to zero as possible. So what is formal charge? Formal charge is basically comparing how many electrons each atom kind of owns and comparing it to how many electrons it has when it's neutral on the periodic table. All of the atoms have eight valence electrons in both of these, right? But all the electrons that are in bonds aren't really owned outright. Uh, I like to use the analogy of, of um, if you, I don't know, maybe when the first, <laughs> first uh, car you ever buy, maybe you can't afford it yourself. So you split it with your, with your parents. Do you own the car? Or do your parents own the car? You both own half of a car, right? But when the car is in the driveway, if either of you needs to use it, you can use it, right? So you both have access to the car, but you own half of it. That's kind of the way these, these bonded electrons behave. Both atoms have access to these electrons, but they only own half of them. So formal charge is defined as number of electrons owned minus number of electrons, number of valence electrons on periodic table. So for this oxygen right here, how many electrons does it own? Out of, it has eight valence electrons total. These ones that are in the bonds, it owns half of them, right? There's four electrons that are in the bonds and it only owns half of those four. Is it sharing these electrons with anything? The lone pairs, the non-bonding electrons, the atom owns outright. So in this case, this is this is your parent that owns their own car themselves. They own that car entirely, right? And then they own half a car with you. How many cars do they own? One and a half cars, right? They own all of the car that's theirs and half of the car that they split with you. So how many electrons does oxygen own? four that it owns outright, and then half of four more, which gives us a total of what? Six. How many electrons is, valence electrons does oxygen have on the periodic table? Six. So that means that oxygen's formal charge here is zero. It owns six electrons here. It has six electrons on the periodic table. Formal charge of zero. What about this oxygen? How many electrons does this oxygen own outright? Two. And then it has six that are in, in bonds, right? And it owns half of those. So three that it's so that gives us a total plus so plus one half of six electrons. So five electrons owned. How many electrons does it have on the periodic table? And it only owns five now. So what's the formal charge on this oxygen? It has one fewer electron. So it's a plus one charge. 
they call it formal charge and not just charge because it doesn't actually behave like this, but this is just sort of a, a way we can use to estimate how stable it is. The more the formal charge is closer to zero for an atom, the more stable that atom is. This oxygen has a formal charge of plus one because it has one, it owns one fewer electron than it does than it has on the periodic table. What's the formal charge for this oxygen? How many does it own? Seven. It owns six outright. And then it has one pair that's being shared, right? So seven electrons owned, six on the periodic table. So it has one extra electron, right? So the formal charge here is a negative one. What's the formal charge on this carbon? How many does it own? They're all, it has eight electrons and they're all tied up in bonds, right? So half of that is four. How many valence on the periodic table? Four. Same for this one now, right? This carbon also has, they're set up differently, but it still has eight electrons all in bonds, right? That oxygen? We already did that one, huh? It's the same as the one on the other side. So how do we know which of these is the better Lewis dot structure? The one that keeps all of our formal charges as close to zero as possible. This one, we picked it at random because it seemed right, seemed symmetrical and that seemed more pleasant to us. Seemed like it made more sense. And that was the right. This one, the formal charges are not as close to zero. It's less than ideal. Quick note about making judgment calls based on it seems right. Um, that's actually what was, uh, I think it was, I think it was Tomps, no, who was it? Uh, one of the founders of uh, the study of electricity and magnetism, the, the way that they figured out that electricity and magnetism were linked together was because um, one of these, I, th I think it was Thompson, it was a Scottish scientist who was going through all of these really complicated calculus-based derivations. Um, and he said that, well, it seems like there needs to be a term that matches that over here because that would make it symmetric and symmetric seems better to me. He couldn't prove it at the time, but he was absolutely right. Um, so because he made a, an aesthetic decision um, based on his gut intuition about how the universe works, we actually that's actually one of the main, main contributors to how television and Wi-Fi and radio all work. It's the fact that electricity and magnetism are tied together and Thompson figured that out on a gut feeling. Um, it was then later they developed the math to be able to write the proofs for why that was. But sometimes once you spend enough time with something, you do develop somewhat of an intuition with it. I, I can't put my finger on why, but I'm pretty sure it's got to be like that. Sometimes you're right. Um, don't get too ahead of yourselves, though. Most of you are not ready for that yet. In general, don't go with your gut just because it's your gut feeling at this point. But just to say sometimes that's right. I first read that story from in uh, one of Carl Sagan's books about, I think that was in Demon Haunted World. He was writing um, an essay about the importance of funding science for science sake, not for any specific application. Sometimes you can't, no matter how much money you throw at a problem, you can't solve it. You can't develop new scientific um, scientific theories and understanding necessarily by trying to solve an engineering problem. You can't start at what you want to happen and work backwards to good science. Sometimes good science happens just because people are curious and they want to know why something is weird or why it doesn't follow our normal rules where the exceptions are. Um, and if we only funded things based on practical applications, then Thompson's research into electricity and magnetism never would have been funded and he wouldn't have been able to make that judgment call. 
Um, so it's a, highly recommend reading some Carl Sagan. Very, very good science educator. His book, Cosmos, in particular, talks about all the different, it's what the Neil deGrasse Tyson and the Cosmos series were based on. He basically talks about how the solar system is set up. You know what? Is it a book or is it an essay? It was, it was an essay first, and I, but I believe it was published in Demon Haunted World, um, which is, I think, which is all about pseudoscience and applying skepticism to marketing claims like alkaline water and things like that we've talked about. Um, I don't remember what the title of the essay was, but I think it was a chapter in Demon Haunted World. Interesting because I had a student in Chem 1 ask me why we would put millions of dollars into discovering theoretical elements. What's the purpose or function? Because you don't always know what you're going to get when you do fundamental science research. Sometimes it seems like there's no application. Um, and then 50, 15, 100 years later, somebody comes back to it and says, oh, well, I th that actually fits into this other issue that I've been dealing with. See it a lot with mathematics and coding too. Math, math research does a lot of stuff that is really, really out there and makes no sense. It seems like it has no practical application. And then 10 years later, the programmers get to it. I'm like, oh, this totally affects how we can write code here or how we can make things more efficient or how a quantum computer works. None of that research made any sense or had any practical application when it was first discovered. Um, and now it's getting close to being really, really important. Uh, here's some more practice with these. The only one I'm going to do right now is CH2O, because that's the first time we've come into a compound that has more than two elements. So how do we figure that? Does that change the process at all? We still are gonna add up our number of valence electrons. We're still gonna put the element that has the most vacancies in the middle. So we're gonna start by putting um, carbon in the middle, surrounding it with the rest of the atoms. How many valence electrons do we have to work with? Well, we have two hydrogens, and each hydrogen brings one valence electron to the table, right? Plus one carbon, there's four valence electrons. Plus one oxygen, that's six valence electrons. Gives me a total of 12, I think. Two plus four is six plus another six is 12. How are we gonna split up 12 electrons so that everything has a full valence? Well, let's just start with our process and see where that leaves us. Start by drawing bonds between from everything to the central atom. How many electrons did I just use? Six. So six electrons left. How many electrons does the oxygen need? And how many does it does it need to gain from where it is right now? Another six. We're out of electrons which satisfies criteria one, it's a good first start. We can't add more electrons. All we can do is rearrange what we already have now. Does everything have a full valence? Does the oxygen have a full valence? Hydrogens? So the only thing that's still left is the carbon, right? So what do we have to do? We need to gain more electrons on the carbon and we're out of electrons we make a double bond, right? You, sh you can cause the atoms to share more than they normally would if you have to in order to fill all the valences. Oxygen wants to hang on to those electrons, but it's more important that we fill all the valences. So how many... 
just for practice, how do we know that this is accurate and not both of these satisfy the first two criteria, right? So how do we know that the carbon goes in the middle and not the oxygen? Formal charge. Carbon has four bonds here, which means it's going to have how many owned electrons? It has four electrons on the periodic table, right? So formal charge is zero here. And what's the formal charge on the oxygen here? Also zero. Oxygen with two bonds and two lone pairs owns six electrons and has six valence on the, on the periodic table. If we flip their position, carbon has six bit electrons here owned, right? And only four on the periodic table. So that means that's a minus two formal charge. The oxygen only has four owned electrons and it has six on the periodic table. So it lost two electrons in terms of formal charge, right? So which of these is better? This one, because it keeps our formal charges closer to zero. Yeah, Ryder? That's usually a good call. There will be some cases where, for instance, if you have, um, well, I'm trying to think of a good example I can do without, without breaking the octet rule for right now. Um, for now, yes, that's a good way to do it. There will be some times where you have to choose between two things that have the same number of vacancies, like oxygen and sulfur. How do you know what goes in the middle? But we'll get to those examples. Push comes to shove, we tie this back into periodic trends. Whatever has the lowest electronegativity, when you're trying to decide, oh, is it oxygen or carbon that's going to go in the middle? Whatever has the lowest electronegativity, which means in more, most electronegative was closest to fluorine. So oxygen is closer to fluorine than carbon is. So carbon is more likely to go in the middle. It's not as good at pulling electrons towards itself. Again, we'll get lots of practice with this. And so you'll start to get that intuition going. All right, how do we name these? Naming covalent compounds, as long as it only has two elements in it, is where we get into those prefixes. And you know, apologies for the formatting. I should just switch all my fonts. I need a font that needs music and help to fix this. Um, that's supposed to say nitrogen dioxide. When we're naming covalent compounds, a lot of times when it comes to covalent compounds, there's more than one possible ratio that they can form. With ionic compounds, if you know what the charges are on the, at, on the uh, ions, you don't need to say how many of each ion you have, right? Because there's only one way that you can combine magnesium and oxygen for them to have opposite charges with them adding up to zero, right? It has to be a one-to-one -one ratio. But for these covalent compounds, nitrogen monoxide is a stable compound and so is nitrogen dioxide. And so is dinitrogen trioxide. All of these, and actually N2O4, those are all relatively stable compounds. So we can't just rely on the charges to figure out what the formula is. We can't just say nitrogen oxide. So for covalent compounds, we get explicit about how many of each atom we have. And the way we do that is with these Greek-based prefixes that are really similar to the um, prefixes that you've seen before. Mono means one, di means two, tri means three, um, one that doesn't show up as often in pop culture 
or in, in normal usage is instead of quad, quad is Latin based. Um, so we use tetra. Tetra means four in Greek. Five is penta, six is hexa, seven is hepta, eight is octa, nine is nona, 10 is deca. We won't really go past that. But there are larger formulas, larger molecules, but we're, we're gonna stop at 10 for this class. All right, so how, how do we name these? We literally just say how many of each of them we have. Dinitrogen trioxide means two nitrogens for every three oxygens. Dinitrogen tetraoxide. We don't really say mono for the first atom because whatever the first atom is, usually that's the central atom in our Lewis dot structure. And so usually we have one of those. So with that in mind, we don't, it's implied that you don't have to say mono, mono nitrogen monoxide. It's implied that the nitrogen is one, unless you specify other word, otherwise, which actually you can have. Dinitrogen monoxide. But literally with, so just like ionic compounds, it was really straightforward naming. Say the name of the cation, say the name of the anion. With covalent compounds, you just explicitly state how many of everything you have with these prefixes. Knowing when to use each system is where it gets complicated. Each of the systems is simple. How do you know when to use which? Well, covalent compounds are always going to be all non-metals. And ionic compounds have a metal and non-metals or have a cation and an anion you can recognize. All right, one last concept I wanna to cover today so that we can say on schedule for your next in-class quiz, which will be a week from tomorrow. I'll give you two extra days. We'll do a week from Thursday. You guys still have class. Yeah, a week from Thursday is perfect because that's before you go, go away for spring break, right? So the Thursday before spring break, which is a week from this Thursday, you're going to have a quiz on these polyatomic ions. Have you seen these before, any of them? Okay. So it's not going to be entirely new to you. Basically, a polyatomic ion is what happens when you form a, put a bunch of nonmetals together in a way that they make covalent bonds, but they still have, need extra electrons to fill the valences. So, for instance, hydroxide. OH with a negative one charge. If we just had OH with no charge, the Lewis dot structure, you wouldn't have enough electrons. You would only have <laughs> seven valence electrons. If you just had OH and it was neutral. So well, what does this do? It goes out and it steals an electron from something. This is a hydroxyl radical. Anytime you have an unpaired of valence electron, it's called a radical, a free radical. That's really, really unstable. So it goes out and it finds an extra electron. But now we have eight electrons in this system and the two atoms together only had a total of seven valence electrons. So this whole thing has a minus one charge. Right, so that's all a polyatomic ion is. It's a covalent compound that needs extra electrons in order to fill all the valences. Or occasionally, there's a few cases where it has uh, doesn't have enough valence electrons compared to its protons. Right, so this adds a new wrinkle to our covalent or our ionic nomenclature as well, right? Because now we have a whole another list of things. That, we, that can show up as an anion, right? So our covalent nomenclature is still say the name of the cation, say the name of the anion. We just have a whole bunch more anions now. It's not just nitride. There's also nitrate and nitrite. And if I speak kind of funny when I'm teaching polyatomic ions and nomenclatures because I'm trying to over-enunciate the difference between nitride and nitrite, because right? they're not the same. What is nitride? 
nitrogen with a minus three charge, right? It's nitrogen when it's neutral, it's nitride with a negative charge versus nitrite, nitride, nitrite is NO2 with a minus one charge. So why am I bothering to give you a closed book quiz on this during class time? It's because if you don't know these formulas and these charges, you can't get the right names for ionic compounds. If you don't know what the charge on nitrite is, how are you supposed to figure out how many nitrites you need to match up your magnesium ions? If I said magnesium nitrite, what would the formula have to be? Well, every nitrite is a minus one charge. And magnesium is what charge? Plus two. So I need two nitrites for every one magnesium in magnesium nitrite. If you don't know what the charge on nitrite is, then you can't get this ratio right. So in the interest of us needing to be able to write these formulas and get these names relatively quickly, we're just gonna brute force it. I don't know of a better way to teach nomenclature, inorganic nomenclature, than just, we're just gonna practice it till your eyes bleed. Um, means I'm gonna quiz you on it. Means I've got a 14 page packet of nomenclature practice that we're gonna get to next week. Um, that's just re repetition to the point where you can't possibly get it wrong. Um, it's not fun. But once you get it down, you'll never have to think about it again, right? And when you get to your college level courses, when you take Gen Chem, you'll already have, this is far from an exhaustive list of polyatomic ions. This is the most common polyatomic ions. There's more than this. If you ever get to a list that's bigger than this, you already have most of them memorized, right? A little bit of review. I'm not gonna pretend that 12 months from now, you're gonna remember exactly what the formula and charge on nitrate is. You might, but you might not. It should at least come back to you pretty quickly, right? So apologies. I know it's not the most interesting um, assignment that you will have in this class, but that's coming your way. And a week from Thursday is gonna be a quiz on these polyatomic ions. So next Tuesday, you'll have an assignment just on nomenclature where you just get lots and lots of practice. You can do flashcards. You have to get the formulas and the charges. And it's going to be set up just like the elements quiz. I'm going to give you 20 where you go one direction and then 10 where you go the other direction, where I give you the formula, you give me the name. All right. So same exact thing you've seen before, just with polyatomic ions. And the good news is you still have your periodic table for this one. I'm not going to take away your periodic table. It's closed book. But now that you've done the elements quiz and everybody passed, now we can assume that you will always have a periodic table with you for the rest of your life. Not really, but in a science class, there's always a periodic table around, right? So with that in mind, there are a couple ways to help you remember some of these. Um, a lot of times, these polyatomic ions have some similarities in the way that they're named. So for instance, you erase nitride because that one doesn't really apply here. Nitrate and nitrite are pretty similar. In general, if you memorize all of the eights, all of the things that end in A-T-E, all of the all of the polyatomic ions that end in I-T-E are the same formula, same charge, just missing an oxygen. So chlorate is ClO3 with a minus one charge. Chlorite, ClO2 with a minus one charge. Right, so if you memorize the eights and you know how that works, that can be helpful. Um, there is a carbonate. Not everything has an ite. Carbonate doesn't have an ite. There is no such thing as carbonite. So if you get confused on that one, blame George Lucas. Um, carbonite does not exist. I was very disappointed to find out as a teenager. <laughs>
there's that extends a little bit too. If you want to take an extra oxygen away, not all of the ice do this. But if you take an extra oxygen away, that actually takes us into hypochlorite. So hypo means take an extra oxygen away from the ite. So chlorite, chlorate. What's the opposite of, just really slow down and stop talking while I'm writing. Um, what's the opposite of hypo in terms of a prefix? Hyper, right? They usually drop the HY. But if you have an extra oxygen on a chlorate, put per in front of it. Per chlorate is going to be what? ClO4 to the minus one charge. Right? So they have these different families of, they call these the oxyanions, um, where they, if you know eight and you know how this rule works, you can get to the rest of them. They kind of use the rest of these to modify the eight form. The other modifier that you see is when you just stick an H plus on something. So for instance, phosphate is PO04 with a minus three charge. So from that, we can get what phosphite's formula is. Same charge minus an oxygen. If we just stick an H plus on it, and it's an H plus, not just a hydrogen atom. So it changes the charge in this case. So it goes from three minus two minus. We just literally name that by sticking hydrogen in front of phosphate. This is hydrogen phosphate. If you take stick two H pluses on it, charge changes again. What is it now? It was minus two. We change it again. We add another H plus to it. So it's minus one. How do you suppose we name that? Dihydrogen phosphate. All right, so if you know phosphate and you know these rules, you know five other polyatomics right off the top at least. Because you know phosphate, you also know phosphite. You know phosphate, you also know hydrogen phosphate and dihydrogen phosphate. And if you know phosphate, you know phosphite, which means you also know hydrogen phosphite and dihydrogen phosphite. Right? So if you learn these rules, that takes care of like two thirds of, of this chart. Yeah, there's kind of a lot of them on there. Um, and actually, the, the format will look a little bit different. I'm literally just going to give you. I'll, I will uh, make sure I post the link to um, a principle, one you can study from. But basically, I'm just going to go through and I'm going to erase half the names um, and leave the formula. And then I'm going to erase half the formulas and leave the names and then change up the order. So it's just going to look like filling in the table. Right. I will, I will change the order, though. So don't plan on being able to just memorize where something is in there. You have to actually read it. All right, and we already kind of talked about the anion names and how that affects the ionic nomenclature. So that's a good place to stop it. Danny, here's some practice for you while you're working on thinking about your nomenclature. And we'll get to more things about covalent bonds and covalent compounds and Lewis dot structures. And we'll talk about lab on Wednesday. Yeah. I just had a quick question about the lab, just yeah. one of these questions here. Mm -hmm. Is it saying that energy wavelength and frequency are all related to the size of the transition, but like how are they related? That's the question, right? Well, it's saying 
sort of. It's saying which metal did the smallest electron transition occur. So we're okay. supposed to know how they're related. So go back to those equations, right? Yeah. You know that wavelength and and frequency are inversely related, right? One yeah. goes up, the other goes down. Yeah. And you know that energy is related is proportional to the wave to the frequency. So frequency yeah. goes up, energy goes up. Yeah. So work that backwards. What has the smallest energy? It's gonna be the one that has the smallest frequency. And the electronic transition is just asking like, like the energy. Like, yeah, n equals What's one to n equals two, or what is the number? Yeah. Oh. Actually, let me. Yeah, this is all. That's what it's looking for. It's just like highest or lowest. It's basically multiple choice. We're just doing it as a comparison. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so next week we will be on Thursday. Yes. Can I take it to Thursday? Because I won't be yes. back until after spring break. Yeah, I think that that makes the most sense. We'll have you do it Tuesday. I'm also realizing we might have. Sorry, that doesn't affect you right now. Yeah, Tuesday works. Okay. Okay. Thank you.